So we have now come to the end of Irene. There's a couple of things that I didn't quite say that, that I need to mention. Remember back up here where it says, because of the sake of the elect, the Lord is cutting short those days. There were two basic enemies, the Arabs and the icon worshiper people. So you got enemies without and you got enemies within. The other important thing to say about this period is that this, you know, in France and Spain, the same, a similar thing is going on, except it wasn't icon worship so much as the interference of the papacy. They had, therefore, the two enemies, one without and one within. The enemy without was the Arabs in France and Spain. But they were held back at 732 at the Battle of Tours. So they were in Spain. But within, there was still the battle with the papacy. Now, during the same period, Charlemagne is emperor. He'd been emperor already for about 30 years. He actually, well, they wasn't called emperor then, but he was king of the Franks. But I want to say it was somewhere around 760 or something. So, the rise of the Franks was going on. And they were, the thing that's important to understand is that Byzantium sort of in parts of its territory was like neighbors with the Franks. So there was a certain amount of commonality of purpose there and so there's a certain bonding that occurs. There's a tension and there's bonding because there's always been tension between the East and the West due to the papacy. Because the East pretty much rejected the papacy from the get-go. They were nice and then after about the 400s or so um, they wanted to develop their own thing and they didn't like what the orders were coming from Rome. Okay? Because they didn't want the papacy having an independent power base over their people. They wanted to, therefore, you know, be the voice of God to their own people. The Franks didn't have that problem. But the Franks did have and did recognize from the get-go that they didn't want the papacy to, they didn't want to be beholden to the papacy for anything. And they also didn't want the people to be beholden, but, you know, that's kind of a dicey thing because you had all those monasteries and they were producing Bibles and there was interest in learning and living on Bible during that time, very strong actually. Um, they were goofball in their doctrines, but, you know, you can't get un-goofball until you've studied Bible long enough. So they were studying it and they were learning it. And just like Leo and Constantine the Fifth and Leo the Fourth, Charlemagne was something of a reformer. Okay, he wanted art and literature to thrive. He wanted learning to thrive. He felt that the best way to have his polity, his kingdom, be you know prospered, was to have people learn. And he also wanted them to be independent of the papacy. But at the same time, if he just like orders like a later Henry VIII is going to do. If he just orders the papacy out, that's not good. So he's walking a thin line there. Whereas with the East, they had just outright rejected the papacy at this point. Alright. They were trying to be nice. It wasn't a formal schism until later, but they were going their own direction and the papacy basically let it happen because what could the papacy do? Papacy in, in itself at this point is extremely weak. It's being overrun by the Lombards in Italy. And basically what happened, and this was really good for Charlemagne, is that the papacy appealed to Charlemagne to help them. As a result of him helping them against the Lombards during this time, what's going to end up happening in 800, which is coming up here, what's going to happen in 800 is that they decide to, you know, ingratiate themselves by crowning him, you know, king of the Holy Roman Empire. But that hadn't happened yet by this point. So we're talking, you know, uh, 794. And I got to the point where I said, you know, that our boy uh, Constantine VI dies here. And then his mother, you know, just takes over. But she herself is deposed right here at Pseudo. And then she dies the following year. Well, there's some debate about that chronology. All right, but the connection with the Constantin with the with the Charlemagne Empire was in fact growing, and that's kind of important because 
when it comes to describing what ha is going to happen next, you need to know that there was support for throwing her out, for throwing Irene out. It's coming from outside the Byzantine Empire. Okay? She herself, during this time of rule, she has her problems with the Arabs still. And she has her problems with other invading peoples. And because she's so power mad, she gives really bad advice. So she starts to lose the support of the people who are even going for her icon thing because to the Byzantines, the thing of empire was all important. Okay? And that's one reason why they started to respect Charlemagne. Okay? And so there's a sort of cross-pollinization of ideas, political and otherwise, going on between those two areas of the world. And at the same time, um, you have a, a certain... Um, anguish, a buyer's remorse by the people who were pro-icon because she was losing battles against the people trying to encroach. And they were starting to need the support of Charlemagne, just like the papacy did. Alright, so that's all um, ripe conditions for a revolution and that's exactly what happens here. Because now we're in verse 22, so let's go to verse 22, which we sort of entered earlier, but I didn't show it. Oh, I don't have a note for verse 22. Let's go to verse 23. Okay, no, we don't want that yet. Let's go back to 20. Is it in 20? Yeah, it's in 20. I knew I had it somewhere. Start of verse 22. I should make that bold. All right, that's where we are right now in the in the uh, analysis of the history and why the Bible is using such satirical language. There's a guy who was employed by Ni Irene long time before, who ends up being called, and it's a nickname, Nicephorus, the Enlightened Conqueror. Okay, he was part of the faction of like the civil administration and to some extent the military under her and he was you know employed by her therefore on her side sort of but like I said she started losing wars she started losing battles and the people who are still in the administration who had you know been in the administration under Leo the third Constantine the fifth Leo the fourth and Constantine the sixth okay they were still largely you know, anti-icons. They were like, let's go back to the Bible. But they weren't strident. Okay? And they were serving in her administrations, and as long as they seemed to be loyal enough, she let them stay. This is one of those guys. Okay? But when she starts losing wars, he's like, no. No, your time is up. So, he's a pseudo. Hopefully you see that. He's a pseudo. Because he's not the family. He's not the ruling family. He's, a, he's an underling. He stages with, of course, a lot of help. A coup d'etat against her. In 802. And then, basically, they crown him to replace her in 802. Now, here comes the, the twist. Remember I said up here that our boy, Constantine VI, was dead? In 797, he was deposed then. He was sent to a monastery and blinded, and I think by his mother. Well, apparently he didn't die. Or maybe he didn't die. It's not sure, certain that he died. There's all kinds of, uh, like, you know, conflicting records. So he might have been alive as late as 806. Okay, so this is 3, 4, 5... Notice how it's going from pseudo when Nikkei Forest takes over to pseudo when our boy, the real rightful emperor, Constantine VI, is still alive. It's not clear. I can't tell you for sure that he was alive. I can't tell you for absolute sure because of this thing that he actually died at the day. But if he dies even as late as pseudo, you see the wit of that as far as the, the Bible commentary is concerned. Because there's a pseudo who takes over 
because of a pseudo Christ person Irene misrepresenting Christ and if he lived until 806 in a way I mean it's it's a reverse funny he's the real emperor and the pseudo emperor is over him you see so it's pseudo prophet this is pseudo prophetai prophetai so it's it's pseudo in the sense that he's the rightful guy but he's dead and the pseudo emperor Nikephorus who is now officially accepted as the emperor since 802 is in power okay now if you were living during those days and you knew this meter you'd be laughing your head off and crying at the same time okay so that's pretty meaningful. So that's the twist in the story. Now, by the time you get to the end here, our boy Nikki Foras, who does manage to reform the administration and do some good stuff to stop the Arabs and all that. Um, the policy that he took, and what they should have done ever since Leo the Third, the policy that he took was, you know what, look, let's not fight over whether it's icon worship or not icon worship. Let's not do that. But in the context of the time in which he takes over, he basically is saying, don't let's fight against those who don't like icons. So it's neutrality. He's neutral. That's what they should have been in the start. You want to worship icons? It's wrong, but you should be free to do that. And basically by the time Nikkei Forrest comes in, that's the policy that he installs. It's like, okay, we'll allow the icon worship, but let's not ban or be negative to those who think it's wrong. Let them have their own belief. That's what was good about this guy. Plus, he was pretty good in administration. He was good at keeping the Arabs at bay. All right? So, on the one hand, he's pseudo because he doesn't belong to the family and he's allowing, I mean, he didn't actually oust Constantine the Sixth, but he didn't restore him either. Of course, the poor guy is blind at that point. He didn't restore him either. So he bears some blame for that. He should have restored him and like, been his advisor or something. His eyes and ears. That's what he should have done. That's the bad thing about him, and so Pseudo is kind of a condemnation against him for that reason. But by the same token, he didn't kill him. So if Constantine is still alive here and this is when he dies, then Pseudo is the best guy to be ruling. Now the other funny thing about Pseudo is that it's a Pseudo acceptance. You know, your Pseudo means false. You think icon veneration is the way to be spiritual. So you think those who won't do that are false. And, of course, the ones who want the Bible instead of icon worship are thinking the icon worshipers are false. Okay, so false is characterizing the time. And Nikki Forrester says, so if the other guy's false, he's false. That's his belief. Let's not have it be a political issue. Let's just be neutral. So it's false to false. Okay? Now, that means that, of course... The icon worshippers, the false prophets of it, they continue to live. So this word has got that meaning too. Alright? At this point we're at 810 and our boy Nikki Forrest has only got a year left. Alright? So he dies the following year. I love this. I saw this with the Constantine kids and I nearly died. He dies at Kai. Now in Greek, Kaiser, that's where we get Caesar from okay Kaiser means prince all right and he's just a Kai because he wasn't the rightful ruler he did a good job though so we can call him Kai not Kaiser just Kai he's an and he's a connector he's an asterisk he connected the two he connected the false icon worshipers with the people wanting to go back to the Bible 
and he was he, he connected the idea that well let's leave both sides alone and not make it a political thing so that's a quasi nice thing to say about him okay it's not a complete you know glowing report but it's not a condemnation like it was of Irene right here false Christ you see the wit this is the kind of thing the Bible prophecy has in it that we don't know about. We don't know about because I don't know why people didn't realize, oh, you should count the syllables. Everybody knows that Greek has a thing about counting syllables. So why didn't they look at the Bible for how it counts syllables? The Hebrews have a thing for counting syllables too. They call it Zephyr Torah. So how come nobody bothers to count the syllables in the Hebrew? It's not like it's not there. It's not like it's not on purpose. It's not like it's obviously on purpose. So why didn't we do that? Why don't we pass that on to our kids? Because isn't this rich and meaningful? Oh, wow, every single syllable has some kind of meaning. Yeah, pseudo, and oh, wow, he's the Kaiser dies, but he's just a Kai. In 811. Now, with that... We gotta go through the rest of verse 22, and I'm sorry I'm slogging through it, but I want you to see how witty this is. And the biggest reason to go through this is because, as far as the Bible is concerned, it's making this the nexus of history. Kurios encompasses a nested doll of Huyas, haha, and inside that nested doll of Huyas are the C, the C verses 21, 23, and 29. So it's kind of important we find out why Bible considers this a nexus of history. It would have to be because it says that this is, you know, a historical trend. So I'm going to finish verse 20, 22 and, you know, because we've come to the end of, um, of um, whatchamacallit, of Nikki for us, and then we'll get into 23 in the next episode.